A lot of things that I've learned in 15 years of ministry, I have to reluctantly attribute to my wife's influence and in teaching. Um, those of you who are married, sometimes you get advice from your spouse. Do you ever get that? Um, solicited or even what? Unsolicited, occasionally, probably. And you're probably really appreciative, right? And you say, thank you for that. Thank you for that advice. I, I, I was so, I'm so excited to receive that in this moment. Thank you for making me who I want to be. Um, you feel my, my strength in that? You feel the passion there? And, uh, excuse me? No talking back in church. Uh-uh. <laughs> Unless you want to give the sermon. No, wait, never mind, never mind, never mind, never mind. So one day we were talking, and she said to me, we we're talking about grace, which is her favorite topic of sermons, is, is grace. And it should be everybody's favorite topic. I, I'll admit that. But sometimes I'm a little law and order. Not just the TV show, which I love, but, but the whole thing about God's law. It, it appeals to me, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And so we were talking about grace, and I was like, but Julia, you know, I get the grace. I don't mean that I totally understand it, but I accept in my heart of hearts that God loves me unconditionally. So, I, I, you know, I'm already there. I, I get that. I don't, I don't need that. And she said, well, wait, just because you're there doesn't mean that everybody else is there, that everybody else accepts how loved they are by God and understands the, how potent and powerful and transformational and revolutionary it is the way God loves us. And that was like a, just an epiphany for me, and I realized how oftentimes we project on people our opinions and ideas that, oh, well, they, they know what I know, they think what I think. You know, sometimes people say, well, make sweeping statements politically or some way. It's like, well, you know so-and-so, so-and-so, and you're thinking, no, I don't know that. <laughs> I don't know that. And we make those assumptions. Well, sometimes I forget, and something I need to be reminded of, is that we can say our Father who art in heaven from now to the cows come home. But that doesn't mean that anyone in this room knows God as his or her father. There's a world of difference between our father and my father. Our father is an abstraction for many of us. And as Andrew said, it may be something you memorized. And saying that prayer may take you back to being a kid in your grandmother's church and, and hearing those words. And it may make you feel warm and fuzzy. Or you remember being there with your dad. Or, or maybe it's something you just learned today. But saying our Father may be totally removed from you knowing God as your Father. Your dad, your daddy. Jesus said on the cross, Abba, Father. The only English word that approaches that meaning is daddy. So for him, it was personal, it was intimate. It wasn't some abstraction or some theological concept that emanates with ethics and rules for us all to follow for the betterment of the world. No, it was daddy. And I believe for us to ever grow into the fullness of what we could be for young people, we first have to go back and to look at and know and discover God as our Father, as my Father, as my Dad, and to know His heart. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have good role models for dads in other places. You know, when I think of good role models for dads, of course, I think of television, right? No? Not, wait, wait, wait a second. There are some good Role models from TV. Does anybody, what about this guy? Who is this? You're dating yourself. All right, Ward Cleaver. Now, a lot of people wouldn't get that unless they saw the beef standing next to him, right? Yes, that's Ward Cleaver. He was a good dad. Kind of in the um, Andy Griffith school of dads. Always had a great lesson to teach. And Beef was like, oh, dad. And everybody lives happily ever after, right? But there are other pretty good dads. Anybody, who's this dad? Oh, it takes you back, doesn't it, if you're in your 40s, right? It takes you back. The Keatons. What show is that? Family Ties. I had a real crush on Mallory. Look at her. <laughs> Woo! Still pretty good looking, I'll, I'll say. Um, good Dad. Good Dad. Love that show. Love that show. Now, for those of you a little younger, maybe this is your idea of a great TV dad. What's, what's this guy's name? Carl Winslow, bingo, that's right. And what's the name of the show? Well, here's your hint, Urkel. 
Family matters. And these aren't even the really good dads on TV. Like, here's, a, here's a, one of the best, I think. What about him? <laughs> Just looking at him makes me happy. I don't know why. And then when, he's, when you hear his voice, that's awesome. And, and now, that, that all kidding aside, that's kind of a joke. But there are some even better TV dads that you might remember, right? I cut my teeth on that. That's why my kids are destined for counseling, because that was the role model that I had. You remember this on the couch? I always thought that was so cool, right? So that, that's what's wrong with America today, parents who had this Al Bundy as their role model. And, and, and the best dad of all. Woohoo! Right? I couldn't find one with a bottle of duff in his hand. I looked. I look, some of you, that's your guy. I know, secretly, some of you. And, and uh, if you take TV and movies and everything, we all can agree the best father role model, for sure. All right. I'm your father, right? Okay, so maybe we don't have enough good role models, okay? Maybe we need, and there's a dearth, and there's a void, and, a, and we got to have a real role model. Now, think about your, your dad. I have to say that when the church says God is a father, while that gives me warm feelings, it doesn't give everybody warm feelings. All right? For some, re some people, that's a reason not to go to church. It's because they're going to hear a word that takes them back to something that's not good. That as warm as that makes me feel, there are some people who that makes their blood run cold. Or who don't even know what that would be like to have a father. We have a generation of people in our world who never had one. So wouldn't even know what that meant. And as believers who want to talk about our faith, I hope and pray, we also should be sensitive to different realities that different people have. That someone else's dad may have kicked him out of the house and said, I never want to see you or you're worthless or or you're, you're a failure, that not everybody has Ward Cleaver at home growing up. And you could say, well, then we don't need to use that language. Or you can say what I would say is that what a blessing then that we have a real father to offer the fatherless, that we have a, a real father who is as real as I am to offer who goes beyond to even my aspirations. I had a good father, but he still was a sinner and made mistakes that he regrets, I'm sure, just like I do. But we have a father in heaven who is perfect, who will never abandon us. We see that explained so beautifully in Psalm 23. We're told in Scripture that David, the writer of this, was a man after God's own heart. Scripture tells us that. But David was a sinner. And you can see that as disappointing or hopeful. <laughs> that despite being a sinner like you and I, he was still a man after God's. He had a desire that was authentic. It wasn't a show. But in his heart of hearts, his inner truth was wanting to know and love and honor God. If you can resonate with that, you can resonate with David that despite his failings, he, he understood something about God's heart and he wanted to honor and, and please God despite his failings. And Psalm 23, I think, shows us that he did know God as his father, his dad, his daddy. He, he knew them in that way that we should aspire to. Do you know him as our father or as your father? I want to suggest that you can't really know him as our father unless you know him as your father. And what that means for him as the father of our family in Christ will always escape you until you know him as your father. My father. He's my, my father who art in heaven. My dad who art in heaven. Boy, doesn't that feel different? Just the words are different. And we see here that David knew him in a special way. Psalm 23 
the problem with this, I think, using Psalm 23 is that most of us don't know it because we think we know it. That sometimes when it comes to the Bible, knowing it is what keeps you from knowing it. It's one of those strange paradoxes that the obstacle to you ever knowing the truth of this psalm is that you already know it or think you do. And so we never open our hearts to how the Holy Spirit is speaking to us through this because we think we know it and because of that we never know it. Take a look at it with me. What does David write? He doesn't say the Lord is our shepherd. He's not thinking about, he says the Lord is my shepherd. And he's not using somebody else's words. David was a shepherd. So he's expressed, Andrew expressed the Lord's prayer in his own words. He didn't say it, but he wrote that. That's his understanding. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. He didn't mean repeat these words endlessly till they don't mean anything to you, but that these things should be parts of your prayer life. Own it and pray it. And so in his own words, that was an expression of praying like Jesus taught us to pray. David used his personal language, vocabulary, worldview to express who God was to him. The Lord is my shepherd. As a shepherd, he knew what that meant. To be charged with caring for something. Not just caring for it, but living with it. Not coming out from your house during the day and then going home, but living out there with the sheep on the ground in their reality, taking them to food, taking them to water, guarding them, pulling them back in when they were going the wrong way. It was a powerful image for him. The Lord is my shepherd, and because of that, because I claim him as mine, not ours, mine, I shall not want. Why did he not want? We want, don't we? Do you want? You want something? I always want something. And once I get that, I want something else to match it, you know. Usually you can find it on Amazon. Whatever I want. Because they got everything. Underwear, car batteries, you name it, they got it. I shall not want... Is there a connection between knowing God as your own personal father in a personal way that blots out wanting? Because to know him in that intimate personal way is to fill a space that otherwise is never filled. Not by saying the Lord's Prayer, not by warming a seat here, not by anything else other than deciding, you know what, God, I'm going to know you as my father, my daddy. I love seeing children with their parents when they get a little bit scared and they grab that leg. They don't know them as our father. It's my daddy, my mama. He says it. The Lord is my shepherd. And so why? And as a result of that, I shall not want. What does he do? He makes me. He loves me enough to make me lie down in green pastures. He is firm with me for my benefit. He loves me enough to do what's best for me, not what will make me his best friend or his buddy or make me happy and like him all the time. He loves me enough to make me lie down in green pastures. And more than that, he provides leadership to me. He leads me beside still waters. He takes me to the places that are good for me. Even if I don't want to go, he restores my soul. His leadership is bigger than that, though. He leads me in the right paths. He takes me to the right places. I think about that because when you know God is your father, it's not because Wade said so-and-so. It's because you say so-and-so. You say, remember that time, God? When I was with those people, God, and you told me, you told me I didn't need to be there, Regardless of whether I did or didn't answer, you were there telling me. You were there. You were in it with me. You were leading me by right paths. So I know that you're my daddy. I know that you're with me. That's your gospel. That's your good news of Jesus Christ, of God as Father, that you can write without my help. How is it that you know God as Father? That's your homework for this week, incidentally, a little preview. 
What is your basis? And you'll be surprised how much there is. First of all, you write down, who is God as a daddy to you? What, how would you describe that dad in your life of God? And when you say, well, he's so-and-so, well, then I would say to you, imagine I'm sitting there saying, well, why do you say that? How do you know that? Don't tell me because I said so. In your life, how do you know him? Not our Father in heaven, your Father in heaven. In my life, I can remember being in law school. And God, not because I was sitting there praying for on my knees in a church, God, where should I go with my life? No, 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 no. He came in and bonked me over the head. I was driving down the road in the middle of the night to Charlotte and said to me, I want you to go in the ministry and showed me images of me flashing in my mind, something that never had happened to me. Honestly, I hate to confess this, I didn't believe in being called to ministry because that just seemed really hokey to me at the time. So I wasn't a believer in that. Fortunately, God's not bound by what we understand. And he showed me an image of my first pastor. His name was Pete Furio, preaching, working with children, visiting the hospital. I could see him in my mind. But then like only in a dream, all of a sudden it wasn't his face, it was my face. And all of a sudden I had this feeling of just like joy and just a sense of clarity that this is it, this is it. He leads me by right paths. Jeremiah said, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. I chose you and blessed you. I consecrated you. I appointed you. Our Father knows us. And he's present. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. And maybe the best news of all here, because there's a lot of dark valleys in life, could be related to a marriage or the end of one, could be addiction, could be mental illness, could be the loss of a job. There are a lot of dark valleys in life that we find ourselves in. And that David wants to stress that God is most with us then. Even though I walk, and I love the, another translation says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, this is a little cleaner, a little sweeter here in the NRSV, but I like the one that says, even though I walk through the valley, not the, just the valley of death, but the valley of the shadow of death. I'm in the darkness of death. And it, and it could be the power of death, of a relationship, of a job, of, of my dreams, of my hopes, of, of who I thought I was, who I want to be. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because he's not our father. He's my father. That's why. And he is with me. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, which he defends the sheep with and which he pulls them in line with, with them you comfort me. So, what I was talking about a minute ago, a lot of times in church, I go, I like to know all the children by name if I can. It takes me time, but I, I get there. And so, when a child is in the church and I want to go talk to them, and I think of myself as very easy to talk to, very accessible, but when you're five years old, a pastor could be really a weird person probably, it's scary maybe, I don't know, especially if I have on my robe that I wear in the early service, and they just run sometimes, or I could just see the terror, who is this person? And so then they grab their mother's leg and their daddy's leg, and then they're like a squirrel on a tree, they go right behind it, okay? And I love that, I just love, not that I'm frightening to children, nobody likes that. <laughs> Nobody likes to be someone who scares children, okay? But I love the way seeing a child cling to their parent because it always makes me think, what if we would do that with God? There he is. But we want to pretend maybe we don't need that or until something really tragic happens and that facade of having it together kind of gets peeled back. And the fact that on the inside we're a child and scared kind of our, our real our real truth comes out and pride doesn't seem so important in that moment when there are no words and there are only tears what a wonderful thing to know God is that father and that before that not have to introduce yourself but to already know him as your father not just our father 
Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. You're with me. You're rod and your staff. They comfort me. And you know what's even crazier, God? You can take the worst thing in my life and make it into a banquet. If you're there, this, whole, this funeral becomes a party. A place where I'm under attack becomes a place of strength and celebration. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. A feast. Holy moly, I just want to get out of here. You say, uh-uh, let's make this into a party. I'm here, and we are going to win. We are going to beat this thing because I am with you. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God, I just want you to get me out of here. Uh-uh, no. I'm in it with you. We're never told in Scripture that it's going to be easy. We're told that God is with us. You anoint my head with oil. You bless me. You fill me up. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And better is one day in your courts. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. We learn from this, obviously, God is present. You want to know him as your daddy? Then know him as with you, first of all. He's paying attention to you. Are you paying attention to him? His heart's open to you. Is your heart open to him? His eyes are on you. Are your eyes on him? Do you have space in your life to even know him as daddy? Sometimes when I pray, I try to imagine myself as a whiteboard. And I try to imagine God has the marker. And I'm like, God, just, just write on my heart. But you know, that doesn't happen when the radio's on and when, and when I'm too busy for, for God and when I don't go in my prayer closet, as Jesus says, and, and be alone with my Father who hears what is said in secret. Jesus says, go in your prayer closet and pray to your Father in heaven who sees and hears what is said in secret. Because that's saying, God, you're important to me. You're my daddy. You're my dad. You're not just our father. You're my father. Do you know him as your father? To know him as your father is then to know what a great father or a great mother is really like. Present. And when they're present, they're present. Attentive. And then engaged. Active. Speaking. Guiding. When you write your story of who that father in heaven is to you, Remember your homework? When you write that down and you hear me say, you say, well, he's so-and-so, and you hear my voice saying, well, why do you say that? Not why do I say it, why do you say that? Well, when I was in college, so when this, this happened to me, and the knowing begins. Suddenly our father becomes your father. He's engaged with us, and we see that. He directs us. When we'll allow ourselves to be directed, he restores us and he can cast out our fears. What a great pattern for our lives. Now yesterday is just a great example of how I totally failed at this, to be a father like our father is in heaven. We went to a basketball game over at Vestavia Hills, Wade's in the basketball league. It's more kind of like watching a beehive really more than basketball. And uh, a lot of buzzing and not much basketball. And, you know, they're going around, and, and sometimes, a lot of times, they, they go towards the wrong goal. I love that. You know, when they score on their own goal or the other team's goal, whichever it is in basketball, right? Or when they try to steal the ball from their teammate. I love that. Or when they're on the ground fighting for the ball with their teammate. Or in some cases with our team, when they defend their teammate. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's like, it's like life. That's our broken world, like seeing through the lens of, of children um, in, in the way we treat each other. But anyway, so after it's over, Julia had the snacks for the team. We rotate on that. And, and she's like, you get Haynes. And, and she went out there to do the snacks. And I looked over. Wade's with the coach. He's giving them their little talk. And so I go out there, and, and I'm thinking, well, he'll come out here, there with the coach. And Julia's, where's Wade? Well, he's, he's with the coach. And I look up, well, there's the coach. No, Wade. And, of course, there's a million people at this place. You know, it's intimidating. I know it's intimidating to a 6-year-old because it's intimidating to a 41-year-old, too, trying to get in and out of there. So, oh, so I, I run in there, and through the crowd, I see Wade, and he's not crying. I'm like, thank you, Lord, he's not crying. And then he sees me, and waterworks city. And I think, you, oh, Wade, this Wade. I think, Wade, not cool. 
And I go over to him, he's like, you left me. Oh. And I was like, no. I was like, it's like, I, I, I said, I would never leave you. I was in there. I thought you were with the coach. And then I said, I'm so, but I'm sorry. I apologize. I would never leave you, but I thought you were with the coach, and I apologize. I won't make that mistake again. And I like to say to them, to, to convey to them that they're equal human beings to us. Say, will you forgive me? And give him the power to express a beautiful gift of forgiveness. Will you forgive me? I'll forgive you. And he grabbed me, and I grabbed him. And and the good news is that God doesn't ever do that. That's the kind of thing we do, but that God always shows up. He's always with us if we'll just turn around and look. You know, people say, in retrospect, I saw that God was with me. You know why you see it in retrospect? Because when it happened, you weren't looking. That's why you see it in retrospect. It's because in real time, you weren't interested. I wasn't interested. We have a perfect Father in heaven who wants to be in our lives, present, attentive, engaged, sets boundaries because he loves us, forgives us, leads us to still waters, restores our souls, and his strength in time of trial. What a perfect image and a perfect model to be a parent. If only we had that model. If only each of us knew him that way. I could say it up here for a million years. That would never substitute for you deciding that you want to know God as your father. Like David knew him. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. I want to invite you to begin this journey by trying to discover that God is your Father, not just our Father. Discover how present He is. Setting aside time. Ask when you open His Word, ask Him to speak to you in His Word and and, and be that whiteboard and, and sit out on the prayer trail on your back deck and say, God, this is my time with you. Because you're my dad. You're the best dad. You know my heart. Help me know yours. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, will you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you this day for being our Father in heaven. Which means so much more when first we know you as my Father. My dad, my daddy. Because then it's when we're talking to you. Not with someone else's words, but with our words. Not with someone else's stories, but doggone it with our own stories. Of who you are. A good, good father. A good, good daddy. A good, good dad. It's who you are. If we'll just open our eyes. Thank you for that opportunity. May that be the first step on our journey of of growing into the parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, lovers of children that you want us to be. To go forward, we have to go backward to where we began with the one who knew us when we were formed and before we were formed in our mother's womb, knowing you as our good, good father. In Jesus' name.